All right. Well, we are sitting here on the majestic shores of the North Saskatchewan River right here in scenic Prince Albert with the one and only Sean Vareau, who is quite familiar with these parts himself, being that he was born and raised in Saskatoon. Sean, thanks for going down to the river with me today, man. Uh, much ap appreciated for having you on. Hey, Scott. I, I come from a long line of, of river go-downers, so it's <laughs> nice to be here with you. Yeah, well, now, just, you know, to, to get things out in the open, I mean, you know, Saskatoon is kind of where you cut your teeth as a performer, right? I mean, you're born and raised, are you? Born and raised, and my my family has a farm uh, by PA in Batosh. Oh, uh, my, my grandparents, uh, my grandpa worked on the ferry at Gabriel's Crossing, and they lived in Duck Lake for a really long time. And um, and I was born and lived in Saskatoon on and off for a while. My dad was a, a really young chef when I was born, so he traveled around to – we lived in Humboldt and in parts of Alberta and B.C. Huh. for a while as he kind of apprenticed and, and learned the gig and then of settled course. back in Saskatoon – by the time I was in grade three or so. So now what makes Saskatoon such, uh, you know, I mean, obviously ideal place for a young blues musician to get a start because, I mean, obviously you developed some serious chops given your, you know, your time in, in, in Saskatoon. There, it's a breeding ground. And the, the old adage maybe is that is because it's so cold that people have a long time to practice, which is maybe not untrue. But more important than that, for me, there were, there are maybe two main hubs of, I, I think, why there are so many blues musicians from there, whether it's Rain Wolf and, and Megan Lane and, and Tim Vaughn and all the kids who've come out of there is the Saturday morning and afternoon jam at the Blues Bar Buds was just a, a breeding ground and there was no age restriction. Anybody who could play guitar at all or sing or play drums could get up on stage and and play three or so songs in front of a, a pretty sympathetic blues audience that, that knew it was kind of like the farm team. And nice. whoever was headlining that night, whether it was Big Dave McLean or Jack Semple or musicians who were touring internationally and were playing there would come down to the jam and start it off and then hang out and kind of mentor the kids who were there a little bit. Yeah. And so that, that was huge for us. And there was a music store right across the street for years called H E L music. Okay. Which is where a bunch of us learned about vintage instruments. It was where all the, the touring musicians would come hang out and either have their amps or guitars worked on downstairs or check out what was in there. And the proprietor, Ralph, and and uh, a bunch of the people who worked there over the years were just, again, really great about taking young musicians under their wing and exposing them to different music and different yeah. instruments. So the between those two things, they were, I think, the reason why there's a, a lot of great guitar player, singer, bands, bass players, producers, per capita, it really, you know, bats above it, its weight as far as all that stuff because there's a there's a, a farm team in place that was yeah. really, really fertile. You know what's funny, Sean, is, you know, as you're describing this sort of forgiving audience, I mean, it almost reminds me like a, a lot of musicians cut their teeth too coming up through church. So, I mean, I suppose in a way, Buds on Broadway was basically your blues church. And that's a that's a good analogy. And you know, when I when I was first starting to play too, I played with this um, this family band, this guy named Gord Pendleton had a band with his two sons. Uh -huh. And and they played in a lot of churches. He did like rock gospel music and they needed a guitar player. So some of my first live experiences ever was was playing with those guys and he was a huge Beatles head and and taught me a lot about songwriting and constructing a solo and performing and, course, and I think you're yeah. right. I think playing in playing in front of a sympathetic audience is good up until the point where then you need to get out in front of audiences that are not sympathetic at all, which is what we did um, not too long after that. I, I started going on the road as a side guy, and then and then Wide Mouth started going on the road to play all the roadhouses of small-town 
Alberta and Saskatchewan and a little bit in BC and Manitoba. And you basically get your ass kicked until you figure out how to perform with authority and command the room and, yeah. and hold your own against a crowd of people who aren't there to see you, who don't care who you are and, and have no qualms about letting you know if you're, if you're not rocking them. So yeah. that was really important for us. So now we're, we're talking about, you know, early approaching mid nineties, right before, you know, your, your very first record came out. This is sort of what you were doing. That's exactly it. Yeah. For the longest time we were playing it. There was, there used to be a lot more, um, kind of a blues club in every big city in Canada and rock bars kind of dotting a, like a line in between each of them that we would, yeah. we would drive a van back and forth on the highway over and over again and, and just show up in these places. And we, we'd, we'd grown up at children of the eighties that were, you know, we loved Prince and the police and, and music that was happening at that time. But for me as a guitar player, the stuff that really just lit me on fire was like Evie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix and both those guys. Stevie especially was really vocal about, if you like me, I might be your your first exposure to, to blues and roots music. Here's yeah. who you got to check out. He'd say it in tons of interviews. Check out the Three Kings, Albert, B.B. and Freddie. And you got to check out these songwriters and check out these guitar players and and he was really a gateway for a lot of people my age growing up to start to check out, oh, I got to get the Live at the Regal B.B. King album to learn about how do you pace a show. And I got to get these records where Freddie King hooked up with, with Leon Russell and made these super funky, heavy R&B records. And, yeah. and in the days before, you could find all of that by checking out Spotify or YouTube. You needed these these people who left trails of crumbs for you to point you into some some bootleg music store or some somebody with a record collection who would let you check this stuff out yeah well now i mean you know it, it's interesting that you would bring up stevie because of course he was you know a, a, a mentor and, and a friend to of course another great saskatchewan blues guitar player i'm talking about colin james i mean did you ever rub mm -hmm. I, I mean i'm sure you you somewhere in your travels you've rubbed shoulders with colin at least once or oh, twice. Colin? Oh, many times. Yeah. In fact, he, um, on our very, not our, the, the major label version of our first record, actually, Colin played some, some national slide guitar for us. Oh, well, there um, you go. and we, we've always run across him on the road and, and actually just played a show together this summer. The Masons and Colin played in Alberta together. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think, I think that Stevie, was so powerful and and so multifaceted and the things he did i think a lot of times people just to, uh, it, the danger is what he did was so incredible that you could just ape surface level aspects of it and and that would be enough to to move people and so you, you run across it and everyone goes through this phase as a guitar player i certainly did where you nail the neck pickup on a Stratocaster, really, really aggressive right hand, certain kinds of bends, certain sorts of note choices, and certain ways of performing that are that are very much Stevie-inspired. But a lot of music can kind of get stuck there where people are doing their version of Stevie. Yeah. And I think when you're a young musician, you go through a succession of those different kind of guideposts that teach you how to do one thing and I think Stevie and is kind of like Eddie Van Halen or Eddie Vedder, where in their wake, there were a whole bunch of people who were just kind of doing a, a, a rewarmed version of what they were doing without the fire at the heart of it or the creativity at the heart of it. So of course, it, yeah. you, I think with, with anything like that, you go through a phase of just, just digesting it and and using all of it that you can learning all of it and then you have to find a way to add your own voice to the conversation sure well now an interesting thing about stevie too is i mean he wasn't all you know a, f a flash i mean there was a lot of substance to his playing too and that's really evident in a live record that he 
put out basically with Albert King, where probably 70 to 80 percent of the record he's playing really laid back, really tasteful stuff because he doesn't want to run over Albert and he gives Albert the space and, and the respect that of course is due to a great blues man but then a little later on when Albert finally gives him that permission to cut loose then he does yeah that in session record is beautiful I think that was recorded in Canada somewhere at a TV studio yeah it was a TV but, show yeah yeah I, I love when when I, I heard that about when he'd play with BB sometimes too where after a while B would go I, I appreciate your reverence and that you, you know you're not you're not trying to hop all over me, but all right, you let your ponies run a little bit. And <laughs> yeah. Stevie and and Coltrane and there's a the thing that happens sometimes where people will go, oh, when when someone just plays one note, that's when they're really telling the truth. But when they play a lot of notes, it's it's a such a fine line between wankery and <laughs> exercise and and just just cascades of meaningful things and you could say bb would do that at the end of songs sometimes wouldn't he where it'd be like he'd just play the most vocal you could sing along with it you could remember it after the show melodies and then at the very end of the song as the drummer was doing the train wreck ending he would just blow some crazy Django reinhardt inspired jazz line over top of it as if to say just so you know i can do whatever i want on this thing and I'm choosing to do what I do for the rest of the song. And I think I think that that really had an effect on me when I saw that live, watching Stevie do exactly what you're talking about. And there, there was a mentor of ours who we grew up, um, met when I was about 22, and then was a, a managed, co-managed our band and was like a spiritual big brother to us named Ross Demude. And he taught us a lot about that, about... You know, first you learn how to have chops, and that's important. It's exercising your muscles and your brain and learning how to do stuff. But then you learn when to use them. And it, you go to some shows and see someone who you're really impressed by for a song. And then by the next song, you're like, I, I think I heard all of this already. By the next song, you're like, eh, this is kind of, it doesn't mean that much anymore. Ross taught us a lot about when to to show a bit of fire and then when to just be really melodic and then when to to do something unexpected and and how to pace yourself through all of that and i think that those are the types of things that you learn after uh either doing it for a while or you can see a performance i remember seeing buddy guy play in saskatoon oh and we thought we had dynamics and we thought our quiet parts were quiet and our loud parts were loud and then we saw buddy who got so quiet in the theater in Saskatoon that you could hear his pick acoustically hitting the string coming off the stage louder than you could hear anything coming off out of the speakers or out of his amps. And then it would just wind up into a tornado of sound, just the loudest thing you've ever heard. And that it was just like a realization that we walked out after and went, our parameters are wider now. Like in, in one song just made us realize the power of of really extreme dynamics like that yeah well and of course hendrix was a huge supporter and fan of, of buddy guy and you could almost argue that hendrix stole some of buddy's best uh you mm -hmm. know tricks of the trade so to speak i mean there's footage even of jimmy right up front watching buddy guy i don't know if you've seen that yeah yeah yeah, I think I think that's really important to do. I think I mean some people come out of nowhere with just a fully formed voice. It's like discovering a you know in the Amazon an animal that, that no one's ever heard of before or seen anything like, and you have no idea where it comes from. And those are beautiful things when that happens. But uh, for for most of us, the path is try on a bunch of different outfits and see what works for you and what doesn't and then at some point either combine it in a way that hasn't been done before or do it with the passion that it hasn't been done with before and and so I think you're continually searching as a as a creative person and certainly I as a guitar player have always been trying to find a way that I could add something to the conversation find something that I could do that 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 wasn't 
gimmicky just so it hadn't been done before and I was the person doing it, but that was that you could explore the newness of find a develop a new branch off the tree that's been so important to me and given me so much that I could in a way give back by adding something else to the to the assortment of things that were yeah. that you could do with it of course well and i'm glad you brought that up because i mean you know the reason why we're talking is you're you're about to release your eighth studio album um on uh i think you said october 27th it's called yeah, october 25th uh, october yeah. 25th geez why did i write down you even said the 25th and then i wrote down the 27th this is this is what's I mean, you can get mind. it either of those days <laughs> But I mean, the album's called I Want to Go With You, and you have spent literally the last two or three years perfecting uh, a, a technique that you like to call your, your C-3PO fingers, mostly because you are putting three slides on your fretting hand at the same time, which maybe, to your knowledge and my knowledge, has not really ever been done, at least with such precision and, and, and technical uh, veracity. Yeah, it was it was a thing that developed really kind of gradually i i play a lot of bottleneck slide with the slide on my pinky and i've always used my other fingers while i'm while i was doing that so i wasn't wasn't really playing an open tuning and playing all the notes at once i'd, I'd be in standard tuning most of the time and just kind of pick notes to play with the slide and use my other fingers at the same time and then i got a lap steel and just felt like a numbskull with it. I couldn't, I couldn't really make sense of it, which which was exciting to have a, a style of guitar that was just completely starting over. And one day it just dawned on me that if I put a slide on another finger, I could kind of do the kinds of things that I would do on a bottleneck by using my other fingers at the same time as the slide, but that I could do stuff that I couldn't do, like with notes moving in opposite directions from each other or one not moving at all and the other moving in relation to it and just started developing it and yeah i could there, there was no mel bay book on it or youtube <laughs> videos or um and i went I, I it turned into an art project kind of of what other things can i put on my fingers well thimbles and how about this kind of slide that spins around and what other kinds of things can I use? And by process of just trial and error, I, I settled on three being kind of the, the right number for me because you need to have some flesh still to mute behind the slides or else you get all kinds of, of noises that that can not necessarily be in tune. And, and I thought if I have five fingers that are slides, well, then I might as well just be playing with my fingers. But yeah. um, I discovered that there was a... a a guy named Brian Kober who lived in Toronto and passed a few years ago. And he, and he has a protege named Mike Nagoda and he did a, a similar thing in that he had like a, a bar and then a, a little mini thing, like almost a bolt on his thumb that he could play melodies with. And, and I discovered it a, a couple of years into doing what I was doing and, 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 you know, messaged him going, I'm not being the guy on the price is right who bets a penny more than you to do more the slides than you. I've just I've independently developed this thing and this is what it's turning out like. And, and he was like, you know, it's a different thing that you're doing. Let's, let's both just keep plugging away at this. So, yeah, as far as I know, uh, there, there hasn't been anyone who's done it, which, which is kind of cool, but it's not the main thing that excites me about it the fun for me over the last five years or so of doing it is that every day i sit down for a couple hours and either think of a song that i want to learn to play or write a song with it and it's it's starting from kind of scratch every time where i have to think okay if i want the melody to go like this how can i play that chord but be able to reach this and it's it's sitting down at a, a blank slate every day and, and and having to dream something up and kind of engineer it. So the process of, of writing the record I want to go with you, and part of the reason that the title I want to go with you was important to me beyond just the fact that one of the lyrics on the record, not in that song, is the times they are estranging because it's a really weird, divisive time in, in the world. And... I love the idea of I want being 
like, let's go together wherever you're going. I'm with you. We're, you know, it's, we can count on each other. It's meaningful. But the genesis of that song was there's a Skip James song called Jesus is a mighty good leader. And I'd, I'd heard Beck's cover of it. And I, and I was really into researching, you know, acoustic blues music from, from decades ago and happened upon the Skip James one. And it just learned the song. It was one of the first things I learned when I started playing the lap steel this way. And then eventually just thought, well, I, I'm I'm content to be inspired by musically what people would generate when they were playing a guitar at first just by themselves. But I didn't want to try and say their words. I didn't it didn't feel right to just be a, a jukebox reciting other people's stuff if it wasn't meaningful to my life or if it was just appropriating stuff. So I just rewrote the words to it and then realized how much I love, as we were saying, I love blues music and I certainly love some records that are like a slow blues where it goes through the chorus five times and someone's playing a Stratocaster and solos over top of it. But I didn't feel like I had anything important or interesting to add to that. But when I started writing these like stompy blues songs on lap steel, I felt like I was, I found a corner of the room that hadn't been walked all over necessarily. And I just, and at first I could only do a couple chords in tune or three or four after a while and four or five. So I just kept the writing really simple and, and went deep down into, into that. How much can I get out of this? And so when we went to make the record, um, we hooked up at Ryan Dahl, who's another Saskatchewanian, um, who's known for his work in Age of Electric and Rim Lifter and Mounties, and is a really great producer and mixer and master of records out here. Mm-hmm. And we hooked up in his studio with just Sass playing drums and me playing guitar and singing and us being able to see each other. And we didn't have a bassist on the sessions right as we were recording most of the material. We just, because a lot of times i just gotten an idea for a song and just kept it really, really not fleshed out. Here's how the verse goes. Here's how the chorus goes. Let's just get inspired and see what happens and not have to have someone following my fingers, which they wouldn't be able to make sense of anyway, because it's so weird looking to find out what key we're in or if I decided to change chords a little faster one time and not as fast the next time. So we just did it live off the floor each time. In No song on the record took more than three takes um, because we just let it breathe and let it be. And there are times where it takes my voice a second to get right into the center of a note or where I kind of flub words or didn't say what I meant to. And we just left it. We let it be what, what those recordings, that recording style before you could fix everything, before you could tune everything and, and move things around and copy paste. We just let it be a, a documentary almost of what happened instead of a, a post-produced production of what happened. So we knew that Ryan is such a facilitator and makes a great vibe and has amazing gear and amazing ears that we just convened there for uh, like three days at a time and would record a bunch of stuff and write stuff while we were there and then record it right after and then go away for a week or two weeks and forget about it completely and then get back together and listen to it and go, Oh, I think we think we know what this record is going to feel like. So we need a faster song than that one and a slower song than that one and a heavier one than that one. Okay, let's write those and then do that and then disappear for a bit. And then we came back to it and we found that Ryan had recorded some bass on some of it. And then we got Darren Paris, who played is on the road with us quite a bit to come in and record some bass on it. And I played some of it and it just felt right. There were a bunch of songs that we didn't end up including on it because they they didn't feel like they were were part of this piece to make it a blues record. And we've always had elements of blues music 
in our in our music I've, I've said before that it's like the middle 10 letters of our alphabet but we've never done something where we just dove all the way into it maybe since our first record although it has a lot more influences on it so yeah and i think people who who've seen us live this might be uh, even though it's a different style of guitar playing, the closest thing to what they've seen us do, where it's a, there aren't very many things added, there wasn't much scripted, and it just kind of it just kind of happened organically. Yeah, well, and I mean, it's obvious, like on some of the tracks, and I mean, this this does this shouldn't be taken as a diss, but I mean, there, there's obviously not really a, a click track going, you know, throughout this process, and. Mm-hmm. You know, as a result, especially on some of those kind of songs that have a bit more of an old timey vibe, I mean, you've really captured something very natural and very organic. So, I mean, my hat is definitely off off to you guys uh, on that front. Yeah, thank you. That was that was the plan was to just let it be what happened, and then and then not fret about it afterwards. Move on to the next thing and record the next one and and capture those moments of inspiration when they happen and, and let them be human and imperfect. And, and if the vibe was right, then move on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, of, of course we met in person this summer at Edmonton rock fest. And I mean, I know there's been, you know, a bit of a hiatus and I think for good reason, right? I mean, you were, you know, you're, you're busy raising your family. I mean, but you know, mm-hmm. so, so much of, of what I heard and so many of the comments that I saw about your set at Edmund, Edmonton Rock Music Fest was I'd never really, you know, realized how great an act Wide Mouth Mason is and how phenomenal a guitar player Sean is. I, I, I mean, you know, thinking about now a 20 some odd history of the group, I mean, you know, why do you personally think that, you know, there's this sort of prevailing opinion out there, you know, that, you know, I, I guess my question is why don't more people know who Sean Vero is? Well, I think, I think a few things you said maybe contribute to it. And I think, um, our singles weren't necessarily, they would, they would be drawn from records that were pretty diverse and the single, you know, if you've only heard my old self from big shiny tunes or something, you go, oh, it's like a nineties rock band. And that would be mixed in on the record amongst, um, other, you know, blues shuffles and kind of funk jams and a mix of different things. So now that, we saw this even when we were touring with ZZ Top um, on the No Bad Days record, on a on the record before this one, that we'd look out into the crowd and go, how are all these kids here? How do they even know who ZZ Top is? And the thing that's, that's changed from, you know, releasing records in the late 90s and early 2000s to now is that people don't just hear about your music from the radio or much music. They can... Mm-hmm find stuff on YouTube or find stuff from curated playlists that are like, well, if you like this, you might also like this. And, and I think uh, there's a lot more people are able to hear a lot more of the different things you've done. So I think part of it was that people would just hear the songs that were on the radio, which I'm, I'm proud of all of, and, and we never included anything just to get played on the radio, but naturally the ones that would get on there would be the, the ones that were maybe influenced by the part of us that was more the growing up in the eighties and loving Prince and the police and Michael Jackson and all that stuff. And the, the guitar playing would always be in there, but it wouldn't be as pronounced as it is on the other songs on the record that are the blues jams that didn't get played on the radio. Yeah. And, and then part of it is, as you said, I, um, Safwan and I are both dads and I was bound and determined that I was not going to, miss my daughter's first steps or words and see it on my phone in the parking lot of an outside a club in Ajax, Ontario or something. <laughs> it just was like, I, I'm going to be here for her life. And it's the most important thing in the world to me. And the, these last few years of, of being around and being with my family and being a dad have been the, the, the most beautiful and also allowed for 
the creation of this guitar style to happen in a way that it wouldn't if I was always just doing gigs and traveling every day and, and living a different life. So I think, um, I think now as I've been developing the playing style and, you know, I, as you've seen, I post videos on either my or the band's Instagram or Facebook every couple of days of, yeah. of a new thing that I'll think up 10 minutes before and go, I never really figured out how to play Tall Trees by Matt Mays, but I love that song. Okay, so I'm going to figure out for five minutes and then sit down and record it for a minute and a half. And I think it's it's surprising to me how many people, when, when we're doing a gig, will walk up either from other bands and go, hey, I saw you, you've been up to this thing. So I think partly the, the weirdness of the guitar style is is drawing some attention, but I think... You, you turn around and realize there's decades of record making behind us. And um, when we at Edmonton or a bunch of the other songs we'd play this summer, I'd be playing one of our songs and singing it and, and seeing people sing along who may have just been being born when that song was made. And it, it's beautiful now how if you, it, when my, my daughter, who's seven, if she goes through a Led Zeppelin phase, she can listen to every single Led Zeppelin record ever very easily, you know, that you have access to all that. If you, you uh, I keep finding new live Prince videos in the wake of his passing and all that stuff being out there that that are just a joy to, to as an archaeologist, to just unearth and go, oh, man, I'm saving this one for a special occasion because... There's this new thing. So I think people have so many ways of finding out about music that isn't just the stuff that's pushed on commercial radio or or that has a, a pretty wide reach that if you decide to go down that wormhole, you can find. Yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, you yourself just earlier today, you know, you, you, and, and, you know, endorsed an, an artist uh, in, in Marcus King and the Marcus King band. And of course, being that I was just sort of out and about doing my dad thing and listening to music and doing chores. I checked him out and I'll, I'll have to say, I, I really enjoyed what I heard. So, uh, you know, <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah. My pleasure. I love doing that too. I, I, I like, um, that's the other thing about the social media age as a, as a, a performer and an artistic person is that you, you can share things that aren't just, okay, here's the record that we've spent a couple of years working on and, so enjoy that and oh maybe here's a video that we someone presented us with a an idea and we worked on it for a bit and here it is you can really share a lot more of your your musical self with people and things that inspire you and and i love seeing that when i I've posted a afternoon soundtrack and and someone goes i'd never heard of that before and now i dig it so <laughs> i'm glad yeah, yeah. Well, now, just before I let you go here, Sean, I mean, of course, one of the things I like to do on Down to the River is, you know, zero in on a specific track that sort of fits my, you know, overall vibe of the show. And, and you know, of course, from, from the new record, uh, you, you get used to it, uh, really, you know, yeah. struck, struck a chord, pardon the pun. <laughs> With me is a, you know, a, a, a great a great fit for the show. So, I mean, you know, what, what can you tell us about that one? Well, it's a lot of the songs on the record are about transition or going from one place to another. Hence the, I want to go with you. There's a song called, you know, I could go anywhere with you. There's the song. I want to go with you. There's a song about taking the high road. There's a lot of traveling to places. And then there's also an element of wherever you go, there you are. It doesn't matter what, if you, you know, if you're unhappy somewhere and you go somewhere else, you're going to be unhappy there unless you, you deal with whatever it is. And the the genesis of you get used to it actually started with the idea of just when we were playing shows all the time, especially in the in the early days of um, you know two Fender basements cranked and live band in a small little room. There was a while where my ears just rang all the time and it was starting to drive me crazy where I couldn't, there was, I realized that it might not be silence for me ever again. And what does that mean? If you can never relax and there's 
some people who it, it, it drives over the edge. And then after a while, partly from not gigging as much and maybe living in a noisier city or over a while, over time, you just kind of get used to it. You just, uh, it, a thing that was the hardest thing ever for you becomes just another thing and you move past it and find ways to make sense of it. Like, well, if a TV was on and there was static on the TV, would that freak you out? No, it wouldn't. It would just be extra noise that's there. So for me, it started out with that, but then it, it, got bigger than that going pretty much anything after a while like i say in the song it's always there i just don't always care in fact it rarely bothers me at all because you get used to it and it doesn't bruise you like it did you just kind of get used to things and so it's a also a bit of a comment on on what's happening in the world where you're like in the, in the amount of time we've had this conversation, something has exploded on Twitter. That's like the president of the United States did what, or this is exploding now. And, and you just get to a point where it, it that becomes the new normal. And you go, well, I guess that's just what's happening now. And people get used to things. So it, it started from a, a really personal place and turn into a just it's we're evolvers we newness comes at you all the time and and people figure out ways to to survive in all kinds of different situations and tend to their own little gardens and carve out meaningful things as as things all around them are changing and and stuff happens that they can't change and they you know that they, they grant themselves the serenity to to just deal with it and move on and get to the next thing. <laughs> well, indeed. And of course, you know, you're getting ready to uh, move into a full album cycle. And, uh, you know, of course, I've had a chance to listen to uh, the record in full. And uh, I'm definitely in, enjoying the, the new direction. And, and you know, I'm, I'm very happy that you've been able to, uh, you know, visit a, a creative side of yourself that maybe you haven't before and that you're you're excited and maybe perhaps a little reinvigorated by, by all of the possibilities that this kind of new way of playing will bring. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, just uh, maybe seeing you play live again. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you'll be able to come out to PA. Do you have any, like, specific memories of Prince Albert? I mean, when was the last time you were here and played a show, Sean? Wow, when was the last time? Well, we I had a, a friend when I was growing up who was a, a guitar player named Dean Dinah, um, who lived there and 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 I spent a bunch of time in fact I think the first recording I ever did was in, in his basement, in the basement of his parents' house. So I spent a bunch of time there playing music. it's been a minute since we last did. I know we did a club show there some years ago. Um, but yeah, I, we did a, a series of shows called the crop checking tour, uh, years ago now where we went to almost every town in Saskatchewan that had a hockey rink or a hall that we could play in us and a bunch of bands. Uh -huh. And it, it always brings it back to me. I feel like I'm visiting my grandparents again or, or driving around with my dad, visiting my uncles who live in the country. So even even though I don't live there anymore, it's a it's a huge part of of our development as musicians and our lives and the, the scenery and the soundtrack that were super formative to to me and to us. Yeah. So I'm sure there will be um, Saskatchewan shows. I I know that we have uh, some showcases and stuff planned as the record comes out. And then what we what we think the presentation of this record more so than playing in clubs and it also fits into our we know that many of the people who listen to us even though the ages are all over the place are in similar eras of their lives as we are so we're gearing it more toward playing festivals and theaters and that kind of situation where it's more of a hang out and really listen and you know the show won't start at midnight on a Tuesday <laughs> you won't <laughs> yeah, have to yeah. figure out how you're going to manage your life around that so yeah in the in the next year or two i'm sure that there's going to be a bunch of stuff in the in the near vicinity anyway 
Yeah, yeah. P- PA is an amazing community. I mean, I've lived here for a little over a year now, and uh, it's funny because, I mean, I think, you know, you're over in Vancouver where, you know, I grew up in Chilliwack, and, and the thought of having to drive that hour and change to get to a show in Vancouver seemed, you know, to me as a young fella, pretty irritating, but the drive to go to a show from PA to Saskatoon is, you know, super chill, like... You know, <laughs> heading home yeah. from a show in Saskatoon, you might encounter one or two other cars, and they were probably at the you know at the same show as you. If they're chances are, if they're on the road at like one a.m., so I mean, you know, di- different <laughs> different strokes, different opportunities, and uh, like I said, uh, you know, I'm I'm excited also to see uh, you know what this record cycle will bring you, Sean, and I'm I've, I'm really happy that you able you were able to uh, come down to the river with me uh, today, man. It's much appreciated. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate you talking to me, and I, I I grew up next to the river, man. It's good to be back. <laughs> right on. Well, uh, definitely stay in touch, uh, and of course, I'll uh, I'll let Sarah know uh, when when my article uh, you know drops. I'm gonna try and get it out a little closer to uh, the album release date, so it'll probably be in a few weeks. Awesome. Thanks so much for this, Scott. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, and and uh, you you have a great evening, man. Like I said, it was a pleasure. Thank you. You too. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on the road somewhere. Definitely. Count on it. All right, man. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a good night.